Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the panel on financial technology. I'm most impressed to see all of you out for a nine o'clock session. <laughs> well, actually, there's good reason for you to be here. Uh, we're going to be talking about possibly one of the most exciting, definitely one of the most disruptive technologies possibly of this century, financial technology. I'm Ling Shui Ling, and I'm an executive producer at Channel News Asia, and we're very pleased to have developed this session in cooperation with the World Economic Forum. Financial technology funding just in the first quarter of this year has been up at close to $5 billion. Now that's reaching back up to these record levels that we've seen in 2014. More than half of that was funding for projects here in Asia, primarily here in China. But the main question is, will these unicorns really survive? And might they actually even turn a profit? And what about mainstream banking and financial institutions? Are they going to be around in the next 10 to 20 years? And on top of that also is, does financial technology really help normal people? It's supposed to be this incredible disruptive technology that's going to cut costs, but will it help ordinary people? Welcome to the panel on financial technology. So now I'm going to go around and introduce you to my very, very illustrious panel, who are going to be able to talk about pretty much all of these things that I've just mentioned. On my left here is uh, Mr. Su Hao Tian, but on the other hand, I have to say, Mr. seems perhaps a little bit pretentious for someone so young. <laughs> he's actually the founder and CEO of uh, Fang Cheng Technologies, but he's also uh, He's an entrepreneur, a young entrepreneur himself, and also a young venture capitalist himself as well. He's one of the World Economic Forum's global shapers as well. Moving on, Kathy Wood. Kathy Wood needs no introduction. She was investing in fintech before it was even fashionable. <laughs> She's a great thematic investor, ARC. Uh, most of you probably already know her. Mr. Tang Ning, Credit Ease. Very, very interesting what Credit Ease does because it is focusing on inclusive financing, a lot of SMEs and rural farmers even, which is something that we, we need to remember. That's, that's what really can be the most disruptive thing about financial technology. Chandler, Chandler Guo is, this is perhaps fascinating even in just what he does. This is a Bitcoin miner. So when you go away, you can actually say you have actually met a Bitcoin miner. And Chandler's going to be explaining much more about what he does uh, and, and what his people do. Uh, even they, his staff, are very interesting because they're young graduates and upskilled farmers. Uh, they do the mining. And OK, last but absolutely not least, uh, Travit Henriquez, who is from TransferWise. And you are almost, one could say, so to say, the most you know, you're the old man of this panel because you've been around doing this for quite a while by, by fintech terms. He was also, for those of you who don't know, the first employee of Skype. Okay, let's kick this off with uh, talking about where is the funding going to and why is it going there? Kathy, would you like to start? Sure. Uh well, I think the reason uh, that the funding is really taking off now is because there are four general purpose technology platforms evolving at the same time. So we've got mobility, we've got big data and analytics, we have blockchain, and we have machine learning. Those are four general purpose technology platforms that are really in their infancy, especially mov mobility, you might say, is not. But in the emerging market, smartphones are. So they're all taking off. And you know, financial services is really one of the largest industries, trillions, trillions in the world, that is still offline. It might be electronified, but it hasn't been digitized. So we really are just beginning this fintech revolution. Mr. Tang Ning, I mean, you talk about mobility. You're right. Uh, mobility is something that you've looked at uh, because many of your rural farmers are actually just using mobile phones. Yeah, that's uh, actually uh, very big uh, uh, in China. Yeah, uh, in terms of uh, mobile-based uh, 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 lending and uh, mobile-based uh, uh, fintech uh, 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 solutions, I think China is uh, leading the uh, world. And actually, uh, 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 going back to your uh, question where uh, uh, funding uh, goes, uh, uh, give you one example. 
uh, when we uh, Credit Ease uh, invented uh, China's peer-to-peer uh, -peer, uh, marketplace lending model 10 years ago, there was uh, no funding at all. Yeah, I was an uh, angel investor, so I funded the company uh, myself. And it was uh, very quiet for uh, five or even uh, more years yeah, until the wind came. You know, there's a Chinese uh, saying, uh, when the wind comes, uh, pigs fly. So uh, then uh, yeah, VCs uh, somehow took notice and the big money uh, went into the uh, market. Yeah, but the VCs, uh, uh, in many cases, uh, paid attention to uh, wrong things in fintech. They paid more attention to like uh, traffic, uh, to uh, eyeball, but uh, more importantly, at least uh, uh, equally important, uh, is the uh, quality of uh, like uh, credit quality, uh, finance, uh, like risk management, uh, fundamental things in finance uh, that investors uh, should pay also close attention to. Yeah, so you uh, notice uh, recent uh, quarters, yeah, people have also learned that, yeah. Hao Tian, as a young, you know, venture capitalist, and you, what are you putting your money into? Are you looking at the quality of the investments? Of course. Um, I believe that uh, outstanding business operation is uh, very important in terms of uh, uh, fintech companies. Uh, specifically, I think uh, the quality of the data uh, in terms of what is, has said, um, uh, data mining and uh, mobility has provided uh, more quality data in terms of uh, uh, offline consumption market. So um, the, the quality of the data is very important. And secondly, uh, the ecosystem, I would say, uh, is, is improving in, uh, in, in China. Specifically, uh, there are more and more SMEs uh, through uh, the, uh, mobile payments, uh, they're, they're um, acquiring more quality data of their business, therefore getting more credit. Uh, that's why I think that it's, that's one of the reasons why uh, a lot of money is going into uh, fintech in China. Travit, what do you think? Uh, you've been recipient of a fair amount of funding. Uh, what do you think that your investors are looking at? I think uh, investors are really following uh, people and companies who are providing real solutions. So for looking at uh, all the fintech companies, uh, making, moving finance from being offline to online and doing things which are cheaper, faster, and better. So investors are really seeing that uh, there are real problems being solved and better solutions put forward to consumers. Uh, and as such, uh, these companies are also making, making a great business case for themselves and having, uh, having lots of sustainable business models. But in these business models, is it possible to have it also inclusive, as, as uh, Tang Ning has been talking about? Um, do you think that you know, one of the things that you can include is this inclusiveness of, of who it is, who your customers are? So I think if, we, if we're all doing things which are an order of magnitude better, so if I look at TransferWise, so we're offering a service which is seven to nine times cheaper than conventional banks, so I think by, the, by that fact alone, we are making it much more inclusive. And I think besides this, uh, everything is becoming much more available on mobiles, uh, which kind of by definition makes it much more inclusive because that's a computing platform of choice for the billions of people out there. Well, actually, I'd love it if you would tell how you actually started TransferWise, why you got the whole idea going. So as, as many good ideas, it came from a personal frustration. So during my time at Skype, uh, I moved from Estonia, where I'm born, uh, to London. But I was still staying on the payroll in Estonia, so every month I got my salary in Estonia, but I was spending money in London. And when I went to a bank to, to transfer my salary from Estonia to London, the bank said, yes, Mr. Tavit, we're happy to do it, and we'll charge you 25 euros for it. But what they forgot to tell me is that the exchange rate they use is going to be 3, 4, or 5 percent different to the exchange rate on the market. So the end result was that the money took three or four days to arrive. Now we're in the 21st century and email goes immediately. Why does my money take so long to arrive? And about 5 percent of it went missing. So that was the cause of my frustration and I thought that when we were able to connect the whole world in using Skype and made, making high definition video calling possible from Estonia to Beijing, why can't my money move in the same way? Okay, Chandler. Now Chandler does something which is so interesting that I'm afraid I'm going to have to ask him to explain what it is that he does. Yeah, I'm the Android investor of the Bitcoin blockchain 
Ethereum. Um, two years ago, the, all the investment talk about Bitcoin. Today, all the venture capital talk about blockchain. Uh, and uh, Bitcoin, uh, right now, the price is a uh, $700 for H1. And the transaction fee uh, is a uh, zero. And uh, I think the Bitcoin will be the future, uh, future world of the money. So in the future, everyone, um, every country can have your the Bitcoin. Uh, for example, today we talk about the uh, Bill Gates have how much money, right? How much uh, uh, he got. But in the future, for example, the big, uh, how much is, how much your value is, uh, how much Bitcoin you have. So uh, the world changes too much, you know. Bitcoin already has the eight years. Uh, it's already the uh, it's become a biggest uh, digital currency in the world, and the, and the blockchain technology uh, is just a the start. They have the Ethereum platform. They have a rootstock platform, and in the future, will be more and more the uh, financial the part of financial company jump to a big, uh, the big, the blockchain the technology. Mm -hmm. So I like the um, invite a lot of the Bitcoin company in China, and uh, across I'm the personal I'm miner. Right now I'm miner the uh, mining the Bitcoin and uh, mining the e ETH uh, Ethereum and. Uh, uh, we are mining uh, right now at the Tibet and Xinjiang and Mongolia. They inherit a lot of abundant energy. They are to totally for free. They are mining the, at there because Bitcoin mining costs a lot of the energy every, each day, every day. Okay, so in the future, Chandler, you say that Jack Ma will no longer be assessed by how many billion dollars he is worth, but how many Bitcoins he's worth. In the future, I think uh, if the uh, Jack Ma have a 1,000 Bitcoin. He is already a very rich. <laughs> okay, now, Bitcoin and blockchain. I'm just gonna throw this now to all of you people sitting here and watching this panel. Now, you mustn't lie, I'm afraid you're going to have to try and be honest, even though it is being televised. How many of you actually understand Bitcoin and blockchain um, at, a, at a reasonable level, um, not just a skimming sort of understanding, but have a real understanding of the, of the two technologies. Would you put up your hand if you think you can say that you really understand Bitcoin and blockchain? Okay, um, I would say that, well, would it be fair to say that that was about less than 10% of the people in this room? But actually all of you are being very honest and being very correct because a recent study by PwC showed that of the financial professionals, these are not just ordinary people, but financial professionals asked, 80% said that they only had a moderate or less understanding of Bitcoin and blockchain. So you're completely in keeping with them. And in fact, 60% said that they didn't understand it to the degree that they felt that they weren't going to do anything about it. So. Bitcoin and blockchain may be something that the panel members here have some concept of, but how are you going to convince everybody else, um, ranging from the persons who have to use it, ordinary people, to uh, even financial professionals, in the financial institutions, uh, in the uh, stock exchanges, everything? Well, how are you going to convince them that, that Bitcoin is, is the way ahead? Travit, what do you think? I'm not going to convince them. Because I'm, I think there's a fundamental problem here is that Bitcoin has been inv invented because we can, but it's lacking a purpose. That's, that's my viewpoint. That, uh, you know, we've seen there's a lot of hype around Bitcoin. A lot of people are buying Bitcoin because they expect Bitcoin to be worth more tomorrow. So pure speculation. But I can't see a real problem Bitcoin is solving. <laughs> 你怎么觉得？我们 at Arc 
。实际上呢，我们是有一些觉得这是一张白纸，因为这是一个现在的一个呃平台，区块链呐、啊，比特币呀、啊。然后这个区块链呢，我们认为是这些挖掘者来做的。然后呢，当然希望。把这两者可以去分开来，但实际我觉得这是一个错误。现在呢，看到比特币，我们可能在一直在说它的市场，现在可能是八十亿或者九十亿美元。那么，我觉得这其实现在不是很多。正因为这两者，我们之前看到了有一些时候呢，有高。风有低谷，所以有很多人呢都会害怕会有泡沫，尤其是作为投资者来说，我觉得有人这样想是好的。比特币之所以有意思，就是说从数学角度来讲呢，它是能够看到不会超过两千一百万个单元。现在可能是一千五百万个单元，所以有些人呢，我们可能看到周六不是有脱欧吗？英国脱欧了，人们就会觉得，哎，有没有一些保障啊？ One of the papers we've written is Bitcoin as a separate asset class, or Bitcoin, the first of its kind, in a separate asset class. Ether will be another one.、Um, so these are digital currencies, and what we've done, we have enough、uh, history now of Bitcoin to analyze this as investment managers, and we can look at the financial characteristics of Bitcoin and see that it is uncorrelated to any other asset class. That's very interesting to us. So you know, just even if you're going to put one percent of your assets in, I mean, I certainly have. I put more than that、uh, because I, I think we're at a very important time in terms of monetary policies. And you can also look at this in the emerging markets. It's well, Brexit, but you, you look at Argentina, at Latin America generally.、Um, they are having to resort to something like Bitcoin. Remittances, Mexico, Philippines. They talk about access. And you know affordability,、uh, they are crying out for something like this instead of being charged eight percent. To your point, eight percent for every remittance. So we think there's a, a, a significant role for Bitcoin. Travis, you don't look very convinced. Not at all. So you know, let's start with, start from the end. So about remittances. So using Bitcoin for remittances is an absolutely horrible experience. You're going to have to find a Bitcoin exchange in the sending country.、Mm -hmm. It'll take Days to get money there, you'll pay a percent or so.、Yes. Then transferring is the easy part. But then, if I'm in Africa and I get Bitcoin, what do I do with it? I have to go find an exchange again, and I'll pay another one percent. It'll take me days. So, you know, as a simple alternative, I'm a co-founder and CEO of a company called Transferwise,、yes. which lets you send money for a very low cost, much quicker, much easier than Bitcoin. So I. I don't see a solution in remittances. So next.、Uh, so, so can I just answer that? Do you mind if? No, absolutely, please. That's why it's a good panel. <laughs>、um, uh, you're absolutely right right now,、uh, but that's because the liquidity isn't there. As the liquidity, as we gain liquidity in Bitcoin, as Chandler said, the costs will be min de minimis, right? Right now, yes, we do face the friction. Uh, and that's because it's so young. But as the liquidity grows, I think the cost will drop dramatically. Tang Ning, you have you're interested in Bitcoin as well, and you're investing in Bitcoin too. Yeah, yeah、uh, our view is that、uh, you know、uh, Bitcoin blockchain uh, is really uh, yeah, innovative. Yeah, uh, is uh, uh, can be for the future,、uh, uh, for the time being in our productions, in our、uh, product and services.、Uh, we have. Less innovative things like、uh, crowdfunding, like insurance tech, like、uh, robo advisor, you know. But、uh, we pay close attention to the future, future like、uh, innovation, and、uh, the way we do it is、uh, to invest in next generation fintech、uh, models and companies. Yeah, we have a fintech investment fund in China. Outside of China, it's a one billion fund, dollar fund. 
doing a global fintech uh, investment. Actually, uh, one of our uh, investor uh, entrepreneur uh, uh, partners uh, is in the audience, yeah, founder and CEO of a company called uh, Circle, yeah, doing a blockchain, uh, Bitcoin-based peer-to-peer uh, yeah, -peer payment uh, yeah, solution. So, do, you, uh, yeah. but do you see this as part of, so to say, the high-risk end of your portfolio? of the investments you're doing, that Bitcoin is still so uncertain? Uh, uh, we believe uh, 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 it's uh, 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 some time. Yeah, there's still some uh, time to build up uh, awareness, uh, liquidity, uh, so on. But uh, when we invented the peer-to-peer -peer model 10 years ago in China, it was very quiet and uh, not crowded at all. And the people challenged us, you know, what uh, you were doing, you were crazy. Yeah, so I guess, uh, yeah, uh, uh, Bitcoin blockchain uh, leaders have to be crazy uh, for some time. Yeah. <laughs> How's Ken, what do you think? Do you think that Bitcoin's really going to be around in, in 10 years, or do you think it will have fizzled out by then? I think uh, for anything new to become mainstream, it has to solve real social problems. But it cannot uh, only solve the uh, so social problems uh, in the end when it's mature. So for something like Bitcoin, I think it has to solve real social problems every step of the way when it's getting mature. So, you know, I, I agree with uh, Ms. Woods that, uh, you know, when it's mature, then, you know, all the costs will go down. But at this moment, it still has to solve a lot of problems in order for it to become mature. So, yeah, that's my point. That's a very valid point, that it should be solving problems along the way, not, not only when you finally reach the mother load. So how, Chandler? I mean, what, what's going to happen? I mean, is this actually solving any social problems? Yeah, think about uh, ten years, ten years later, uh, it's a uh, for Bitcoin. Ten years later, it's uh, not too much time. But you think about the Bitcoin, the rule, you know, the every four years they have a halving. Uh, next month will be next halving. When the next halving, today one block, you know, uh, reward the miner the twenty-five Bitcoin, and. Uh, after the halfling will be the 12 uh, for each block for reward the miner. So our, we were diff it's for miner, we were difficult to kind of difficult mining for mining a one Bitcoin. The cost is too much to get a one Bitcoin. It's just uh, eight years. So I think Bitcoin the, in the future is all world GDP will be based on Bitcoin. So you tell me, the, if, the, if, if you ask me the, what is Bitcoin value, I mean, I, I'll tell you the Bitcoin value is the whole world GDP value in the future. When my grandson days or my daughter day, they will be coming soon. Because I'm a, today my daughter uh, uh, don't use in cash, you know? They buy everything by the Apple Pay. Uh, by the game they like, right? Uh, in the future, there will be no, maybe, no, no people using cash. No people using the, you know, in, uh, the, the real money. The people using the number, you know, digital uh, currency. Like uh, China, the um, uh, central bank, they have the idea that they want to make their digital RMB. Uh, but in the future, all the world, world, all around the world, the different countries have their different, different the, uh, digital U.S. dollar, digital the uh, RMB, right? But they need uh, some, uh, some the uh, the digital currency like Bitcoin, the force the Bitcoin, force the digital currency uh, like Bitcoin to do our. Uh, to do our international uh, transfer. And Bitcoin basically, I, I will ask, answer you uh, another question about it. You don't believe right now, but in the future, when you realize you're already late. You know. <laughs> <laughs> in terms of solving real problems, I think the elephant in the room is the 2008-9 financial crisis and people not trusting banks right now. So. Uh, blockchain is a digital ledger, fully transparent. 
right? A lot of people who think money laundering and all of that's going to take place, you know, it's ve you know, the government and, and uh, uh, the CIA and FBI are very happy that this is happening because they can trace so much. Mm -hmm. So that's why we're not hearing more Silk Roads or, or Mt. Cox. So it, uh, transparency gets at the fraud issue, you know, surfacing that. Then we've got an audit trail, digital ledger audit trail. So make sure rules are based. You don't need a bunch of middlemen telling you that rules have been followed, right? So we're eliminating a lot of middlemen here. I mean, this is hundreds of billions of dollars. And then the last thing is smart contracts are automatic, again, taking away middlemen roles. Yeah. So anything with friction, any transaction with friction, you can think real estate in particular, is, is uh, going to benefit. We'll see a lot of problems solved with, with this kind of system. OK, let's see whether or not Chandler and Kathy uh, have managed to convince all of you in this last few minutes that you're all being a bit late about the Bitcoin <laughs> and that you really ought to be getting on board. OK, how many of you think that Bitcoin's going to be around the next 10 years and we're really going to be seeing uh, you know, digital currencies? GDP is going to be valued in Bitcoin. OK, a quick show of hands of GDP in Bitcoin in the next 10 years. Gosh. I'm really sorry, <laughs> Kathy and Chandler. Nobody believes that. I have something to say about that. I actually have just something to say about that. I love this. When we put, we're the first uh, funds in the public funds in the United States to gain exposure to Bitcoin. When we put it in the fund, we had to go through the New York Stock Exchange, SEC. They were like, "What are you doing?" And we put it in, and the journalists basically wrote us up and said, "Ah, oh, this is just a gimmick." Frankly, that's how disruptive innovation always starts. That's all we do is focus on disruptive innovation. This is a very good sign. OK, so your lack of interest is a good sign. <laughs> Let's move on to one of the things that Kathy mentioned, and that is fraud. Um, one of the incredible things about financial technology is that, of course, it's changing things tremendously. But at the same time, because of, to some degree, a lack of transparency in what's actually going on in the actual processes, we're getting certain rather unpleasant fraud cases taking place. Here in China, there's been a very large uh, fraud case as well. Uh, in the States, there's been the same thing as well. What do you think, I mean, Hao Tian, uh, fraud? Is that something that, you know, uh, financial technology will be just as uh, vulnerable to as, let's say, conventional banks? Or do you think that there will be more transparency? I think fraud will all, um, happen everywhere. It's common. But uh, I think... Um, one of the future that uh, what happened is that for the uh, people in the industry to solve the industry problems themselves, here at uh, Function Technology, what we do uh, is that we uh, help the uh, landlords in uh, commercial real estate to make better decisions because they, they are the ones that actually know the businesses, the brands better, and the consumers that actually spend there better than any other banks. So, you know, it's, it's actually very straightforward for them to actually uh, uh, lend the money to the businesses because they actually know the data. So, you know, that's uh, one of the ways that I think will happen in the future in our industry. And that's one of the uh, things that, w that we are helping to solve is, you know, to let the uh, SMEs offline to actually get more uh, money from the people that are actually doing business.